This is going to be verse by verse of 1 John chapter 1. And we're going to look at basic beliefs for King James Bible believers. So let's start in chapter 1, of course. And we're just going to pull out some basic truths for Bible believers that's found in this chapter. So getting right into it, number one, we see the deity of Jesus Christ. That is, we see the fact that Jesus Christ is God. 1 John 1, 1 says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. The phrase, from the beginning, shows us that Jesus Christ wasn't created. He didn't just get born one day. He's always been and he is from the beginning. John 1, 1 through 3, the Gospel of John, the same author, we see in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So, Jesus Christ is the Word, obviously, mentioned in these verses, and Jesus Christ wasn't just born one day of a virgin. The man Christ Jesus was. But remember, Jesus Christ is fully God and was fully man at the same time. But he said, before Abraham was, I am. He's always been and always will be. Colossians 1.16 says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And this is the meaning of life. Uh, the Bible says, For his pleasure we are and we're created. And the purpose of us being here is just to please him. Colossians 1, 17 through 19 says, And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. So the same person who created the worlds is the same person who died on the cross to save the world. The same person who created the world is the same person that lives in you. The same person that created the world is the same person that desires fellowship with you through prayer. And that's a big theme in 1 John is fellowship. Think about this for a minute. You can have fellowship with the person that made the stars and the moon and the clouds and all the things that you see when you look up. And the Lord Jesus Christ said in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8, He says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. So Jesus Christ is not only the beginning, but also the ending. He is the Almighty. John wrote that verse in Revelation 1.8 just like he did this short epistle. He definitely believes in the deity of Jesus Christ. Uh, see, this is John. This isn't John the Baptist. This is the Apostle John that wrote this epistle. And he also wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote, wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And he wrote Revelation. And he is the... Those are the last books to be written for the Bible. And he had all of the Bible at his disposal when he wrote, the, wrote these things. So, I mean, these are, these are very relevant for us. I mean, this isn't just for people in the tribulation. 1 John... Is, is to the church as well. Now, 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. So they heard him preach. It says, which we have heard. John literally heard the Lord Jesus Christ preach. He heard him cast out devils. He put his head on his chest and heard his heartbeat. Uh, he heard him walking. He heard his footsteps. He heard him sleeping. He heard him breathing. And during the Lord's earthly ministry, men saw him with their eyes. They saw him in his resurrected body. Uh, Jesus said, no man has seen God at any time. But they saw the Lord Jesus Christ 
in the flesh. No man has seen the Lord's soul. But God was manifested in the flesh. And when Paul gives the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, he also says in verses 5 and 6, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. So many witnesses saw Jesus Christ after he was risen from the dead. There were so many witnesses. Their hands handled him, as the verse said. John leaned on him. Thomas touched his hands and his side. And while we ourselves didn't physically touch Jesus Christ, we accept it all by faith and see and hear and handle the written word of God, which is actually a more sure word of prophecy. It's more sure because a spirit could visit you at night claiming to be Jesus Christ, but you would have no proof it was him. With the Bible, we have a more sure thing. I've decided, and I hope that you have, that you're going to accept by faith what the book says. The Bible is a better proof that Jesus Christ is real than an actual appearance of him in your bedroom would be. 1 John 1, 2 says, For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. So 1 John 5, 11 says, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. So this eternal life, we need to bear witness of it. We need to show people how to get it. Jesus Christ is God manifested in flesh, and that's the incarnation. It says in 1 John 1, 2, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it. John saw God manifested in flesh. And Paul writes in 1 Timothy 3.16, he says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. And every Christian should bear witness of this truth. 1 John 1.3, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Calling Jesus Christ the Son of God makes Him equal with God. And that's what John does here. He calls Him the Son of God. He said, with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And in John 5, 18, it says, Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill Him, because not, he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. So even unsaved Jews realized that Jesus Christ declaring to be God's Son was a declaration that he was equal with God. And then in Philippians 2, 5-6, through 6, Paul writes, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So that shows you that Jesus Christ had no problem claiming to be God and had no problem with other people calling him God. And the new versions will change this to, to attack the deity of Jesus Christ. And they change it to something like he didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. And that verse in 1 Timothy 3.16 where it says, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. They take out the word God and put He was manifested in flesh. Just subtle attacks on the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the deity of Jesus Christ is a basic belief for anybody who claims to be a King James Bible believer. And if you don't believe Jesus is God, then you're not a Bible believer. Now, number two, if you are a Bible believer, then you believe in Bible reading. Notice this truth in 1 John 1, 4. It says, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. So if reading what the Holy Spirit told John to write gives joy, then this shows we need to read the Bible. Isaiah 34, 16 says, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. The God who is from the beginning, the one who is eternal life 
is the same one who wrote 66 books of the Bible. And in, in your hands, you have what God in heaven wrote. And you can have 24-7 access to it. It's everywhere you go. It's in, the, it's in the hospitals. It's in the doctor's office. You can find it at Walmart. It's on your iPhone. It's everywhere you look. We have more access to the Word of God than we've ever had before. You have more access to preaching now than you've ever had before. It's easier to listen to preaching now than it ever has been in the history of the world. You can have thousands of sermons just on your phone. You can have an audio Bible on your phone. The truth is so much out there, people just don't want it. In Psalms, it says, Blessed is the man that delighteth in the law of the Lord. You know, you need to de delight in this book. And your joy will be full when you feast on the words of God. And I believe every believer should be a daily reader of the word. Next, if you are a King James Bible believer, then you don't just believe in the, the deity of Jesus Christ and Bible reading. You also believe in the Godhead. And this is also known as the Trinity. And I don't have a problem with that word one bit. I don't have a problem with the word Trinity. I mean, j just because it isn't in the Bible doesn't mean it's not biblical. Because there's things taught in the Bible that just people's thought up a word to go along with the, what the Bible taught. I mean, I prefer the word Godhead. I just like that word better. But in 1 John 1, 3, it says, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Now this shows that there is a Father and a Son, both God, two different persons of the Godhead, yet one. They are the same, but different. We don't believe it's only Jesus, but we also don't believe in three gods. And this is one of those things that you shouldn't try to figure out because you can't figure it out. And there is a danger of trying to bring God down on your level to where you can figure him out. First John 1 John 1.4 says, And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. And joy is a fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that's living inside the believer. So there in two verses, we can see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this makes up the Godhead. And 1 John 5.7 it says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So one in three, and three in one. And I don't like to go beyond that. My mind can't comprehend it. All three are God, and all three are one. None of them is lesser than the other. And you see all three in the creation. If you turn back and look in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said that there be light, and there was light. So there in the first verse it says, In the beginning God, there's the Father. And then the second verse it says, And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. There's your Holy Spirit. And then in verse 3 it says, And God said, Let there be light. That's your word. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. So all three are God. They're all three the same, yet they're different. Three persons, one God. You can't explain it. And while the word Trinity may not be found in the Bible, the word Godhead certainly is found in the Bible. Colossians 2, 9 says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 17, 29 says, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. And then Romans 1, 20, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So if you're a Bible believer, then you must believe in the Godhead. And you must also believe in the sinlessness of the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 John 1, 5, it says, This then is the message which we heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If Jesus is God, and he's light without darkness, 
then he doesn't sin. And Hebrews 4.15 says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Uh, 1 Peter 2.22, Who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. So these verses says, He was yet without sin. It says he knew no sin. And it says he did no sin. So the Lord Jesus Christ came down as a man and lived a sinless life so that we could be saved, so that we wouldn't have to pay for our own sins. He came down to pay for our sins himself, and when you believe in him, you get his sinless record applied to you, and also your sinful record gets taken away. And this is called imputed righteousness. So God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. God is love, as John says in 1 John 4, 8, he says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. So God is light and God is love. And a balanced view of God also shows us that he is a consuming fire. Hebrews twelve twenty nine says, For our God is a consuming fire. God is also jealous. And Hebrews 12, 20, or in a, a verse... Back in the Old Testament, it says our God is a consum- our, our God is a jealous God. I believe it's in Deuteronomy. So you have a balanced view. All the scary attributes of God doesn't mean He's a mean God. It's just righteous anger. And God is a balanced being. If God is love, then God has to hate something to truly love someone. If you know, if God hates murder. He's going to hate abortion. And if he, if he loves babies, he's going to hate abortion. He's going to hate some things. But every King James Bible believer should believe in God as a balanced being. He's not just light and love. He's also a consuming fire. He's also jealous. He's also full of wrath and anger at times. The Bible says he's angry with the wicked every day. But next, if you're a King James Bible believer, you need to believe in Christian separation. 1 John 1, 6 says, If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So if we say we have fellowship, and yet we are living contrary to how He tells us to live, then we are liars. And as a Christian, we need to be separate from the darkness. Ephesians 5, 11 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Second Corinthians six fourteen says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness. Second Corinthians six seventeen says, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So we should be nice to sinners, we should love sinners, witness to sinners but we shouldn't participate in their sin, and we need to be separate. And the next one, this is another big one again. If you're going to be a Bible believer, then we need to believe in the blood, the importance and the preciousness of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in 1 John 1, 7, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. So the blood not only washed away our sins, past, present, and future, but it also gives us a daily cleansing. And it's not just the death of Jesus Christ that saves us. It is His shedding of blood. And God always required a blood sacrifice. They didn't just kill the lamb at the Passover. They also put His blood on the doorpost. But the new versions, of course, just like they removed the deity of Jesus Christ, they want to remove the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But God purchased us with His own blood. We're redeemed by His blood. We get justification through His blood. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. And when it comes to eternity, and also in this life we live on earth, it cleanses. So when it comes to eternity, it's took all our sins away. And then in this life, when we're walking in our daily Christian walk, it cleanses us of our sin that we commit daily. 
And no matter how we try, we're probably going to end up sinning, even though we don't have to sin. But next we see the sinfulness of man and our standing versus our state. In 1 John 1, 8, it says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So anyone who doesn't believe they are a sinner is not ready to be saved. And you can't be saved unless you know why you need a Savior. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And you can't preach the gospel without showing a man his sins. In Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's a common verse to use when witnessing to somebody. And if we say that we are sinless after salvation, we're deceived. That's the holiness crowd. If they think they're sinless, they're crazy. If you believe you are without sin, then you have a low moral standard. And people with low moral standards will only recognize things like adultery and drunkenness and drug use and murder and stealing as a sin. And they forget about the inward sins that people can't see. Uh, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's not for salvation but for fellowship. This is about your daily Christian walk. You confess your sins every day. Every time you sin, you need to confess that sin. That way your fellowship with God will stay unbroken. And uh, your standing in Christ is sinless, of course. When it comes to eternity... God sees you as perfect as the Lord Jesus Christ because you got Jesus Christ's righteousness. But when it comes to your state, that's how you're living here in the flesh. How you're living at any given moment in the flesh is your state. And you need to make your state get to match your standing as close as you possibly can. I mean, it's, not, it's never going to match perfect while you're here in this life because you're still going to have that old sinful flesh. But you need to get your state to match your standing as close as you can get it. Your standing is sinless perfection. And you need to strive for sinless perfection. But God sees us as sinless when it comes to our names being written down in heaven. However, He sees our flesh as sinful and requires a close walk and confession of sin when we mess up. And that's for fellowship. We are in fellowship with God when we keep His commandments. And if we confess shortly after sinning, then our fellowship can remain unbroken as small a time as possible. Now, 1 John 1, 1.10, If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. And God Himself said He can't lie. Titus, Titus 1, 2 says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. He cannot lie. But Romans 3, 4 says, Let God be true, but every man a liar. So if someone tells me they haven't sinned since they got saved, I say, Let God be true, but every man a liar. They sin just by calling God a liar because they don't believe this verse. They're calling God a liar for saying that they haven't sinned. But this has been verse by verse of 1 John chapter 1, and we just pulled out some a few basic beliefs for Bible believers. Now, if you've made it this far, and you don't know that you're saved, you need to get saved today. Today is the day of salvation. Paul tells us the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. He says, Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and He was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Jesus Christ... The eternal God died on the cross for your sins. You've sinned against God. And if you don't get those sins paid for, then you're going to go to hell. And if you want them sins paid for, you need to come to Jesus Christ the best way you know how and believe on Him and what He did on the cross to be your payment for sin. And that's the only way out of hell. That's the only way that you're going to get to go to heaven. That's the only way that you're going to be saved. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So come to Jesus Christ right now the best way you know how and believe on Him before it's too late.